Are you talking shift? We are. It's time for the We're Talking Shift podcast. Now, now, now. Here to talk shift, Lori Bischoff. We're talking shift. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. Or I guess depending on where you live on the planet, good morning or good evening. Thank you so much for tuning in to episode 88 of We're Talking Shift. This is the podcast where we talk shift. Because when we feel stuck, if it's time to level up, rise to a challenge, make a health shift, a relationship shift, an emotional shift, basically any kind of meaningful, effective change in our lives, the first thing we have to shift is our thinking. That is the antidote to feeling stuck. If you have been listening to my podcast for a while now, you already know that cultivating optimal health is something that's really important to me. It's something I've been doing for well over 30 years because I think that striving to be healthy should be a priority. So as you know, I harp on it a lot. Today's not going to be any different. Juicing is something that I initially got interested in years ago when I was learning about the Gerson therapy for healing cancer patients. But then about nine years ago, I watched a documentary called Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. It is so good, you guys, and it really broadened my understanding even more about the powerful benefits of juice fasting to heal and eliminate countless health conditions, which brings me to the special guest I have the immense pleasure of speaking with today. Joe Cross is a New York Times bestselling author and filmmaker. His first film, Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead, has been seen by over 30 million people worldwide and is largely responsible for introducing most of those people to the world of drinking something green that's not Kool-Aid. He is the founder and CEO of Reboot with Joe, which is the guardian of his global community of over 1 million people who are interested in being inspired and learning how to pump up the volume of their micronutrient intake in order to reverse disease, lose weight, and improve their health on all levels. Joe's personal journey, which is the subject of his award-winning documentary, is quite phenomenal, and I'm super excited to have him share what he's learned with you. So let's get into it and start talking some health shift. Joe, welcome aboard. Thanks, Laurie. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm, I've been excited about talking to you for quite some time. So uh, let's see what shifts we can start making, eh? I like it. I like it a lot. So... Joe, usually at some point in a conversation with my guests, I invite them to share their going rogue story with us. But I feel like with you, it should be the kickoff. And so how do you feel about sharing a time when you were heading solidly in a direction and then for whatever reason, you made a radical decision to do a complete change of direction, maybe even against all reasoning, and this going rogue move turned out to be the best decision you ever made. Yeah, I love I love your terminology of going rogue because it's it's it it spells out to a T exactly what I did in 2007. If I for those people who haven't watched my movie or haven't seen my story or heard about it, essentially there's the there's the pre-going rogue and then there's the post-going rogue story. Now, the pre-story, I think it's pretty much something that so many people can relate to because I was in my 30s and I got sick. I, I broke. I, I use this definition of either you're whole or you're broken. I, I like dealing in binaries. And mm -hmm. I was I was whole for quite some time. And then at 32, I broke. I never thought it would happen to me. I always thought chronic illness, autoimmune diseases, People have to take meds every day. I always thought that was going to be somebody else. You know, that's not going to be me. That's other people get that. Right. But shock and awe, at 32, I broke, and I broke with an autoimmune disease called chronic urticaria angioedema, which is effectively a fancy way of saying chronic hives that are not just on the surface of the skin. They're below the very last layer of skin on your, oh, on your wow. body, so below what we call the dermis. Okay. And this reaction is that my body thinks uh, with pressure and touch, any physical touch, sitting, walking, um, holding groceries, holding a baby, 
uh, playing tennis, golf, lifting weights, whatever you do with any pressure, your belt too tight, a seat belt. This pressure on the body, the my my body was confusing it as though somehow mosquitoes or some kind of wasp or something had broken the dermis. So it was just releasing histamine like a crazy person all over my body. And so I was welting, swelling. It was leaking into my joints. I couldn't I couldn't move my fingers, my arms. Some mornings I'd wake up looking like the elephant man. It mm. was a it was a tragic um, uh, situation and Sometimes these things come for a couple of days, Laurie, and go away. But after six weeks of taking uh, 60 to 70 milligrams, well, actually, I think I was over 120 milligrams of prednisone a day in the beginning. Oh. My doctor said, Joe, unfortunately, you're one of these very rare, rare cases where you've got this and you may well have it for life. So off I started on my journey of 60 milligrams of prednisone a day at the age of 32, 30 milligrams in the morning, 30 milligrams in the afternoon. And I kid you not, I could not function if I didn't take these pills. It was it was virtually impossible for me to function if I didn't take those tablets. So over this next sort of eight years, uh, I developed uh, pre-diabetes. I had high cholesterol, high blood pressure. I started taking an endless an endless uh, stream of pills. And on my 40th birthday, uh, when I looked in the mirror and I really sort of didn't recognize who I was, I was about 345, 340 pounds. I, um, I basically was reaching for the, the meds after a massive night out where I'd had a lot to drink, a big Chinese takeaway meal for my birthday. I really just, I really just had this moment Laurie, where I just said, you know, are you are you crazy? Are you stupid? I mean, who mm-hmm. are you? Who is this person looking back at me? Yeah. I didn't recognize I didn't recognize myself in the mirror, and um, I guess that was the moment that I decided that enough procrastinating, enough. I'll get around to this. You know, I was busy with my businesses. I had a bunch of startups. I was I was quite successful in financial markets. So you know, if you're measuring mm-hmm. success by the bank account. I was doing pretty well, so I was I was pretty much just this this sort of person that was ignoring ignoring uh, my health and focusing on wealth. So right. I had my priorities completely out of whack. Yeah, so- speaking of priorities, if I can stop you for a second, Joe, I do remember because uh, I made a note of this. It, it actually kind of made me chuckle uh, when I was watching it. it. You literally in the documentary laid out your priorities, and what they said was was work, partying, ice cream, women, beer, soda, and email. <laughs> and I, and I, and I, <laughs> right? See, I told right. you I was pretty normal. <laughs> yeah, that, and that was my, my point is that sounds like a lot of people's priorities for about, you know, from about age 20 to 50. So for about yeah. 30 of your prime years, you know, or what should be some of your prime years of life, those were your priorities. Um, and yeah, and then, but only at 32, though, you didn't even get all the way to like in your 50s and 60s. You broke, to use your term, at 32, you were still super young. Yeah, I broke early. And, yeah. and um, you know, in some respects, and I say this in the movie, I'm actually pretty glad I broke early, to be honest, because, um, you know, if I didn't break then with, with that illness, maybe I would have broken with a heart attack or a stroke right. or cancer or something else down the line. So, mm-hmm. look, effectively, what I was doing is I was ignoring the biological laws of cause and effect, Laurie. I was ignoring it, and I was thinking – that I was someone who could get away with it, that that these diseases and illnesses, I was it was firmly in my mind that this stuff happens to other people. Sure. I'm invincible. I can run through brick walls. It won't touch me. And so when the when it comes, I was in a state of denial for quite some time. Um, and look, the, the idea of to, to zero in on the going rogue yeah. The going rogue part for me was that I looked back at my life and I realized that it was only 20 years ago I was playing competitive rugby. I was running 10 miles three times a week. I was as fit as a Mali. I was a lifesaver or lifeguard to use the American terminology. You mm-hmm. know, I was an athlete. And here I was. I'd gone from 
basically 220 pounds, which was my fighting weight, basically, to like 340, 345 on my birthday. Now, that was like, now I know prednisone and the medication I was taking was a contributor to that, but still, I had turned my back on Mother Nature. I, I had basically just given Mother Nature the bird. I wasn't consuming anything like the amount of produce that's recommended. Uh, or, you know, I, I was, I was the, the average, I'll give you, I'll give you a, a stat. The average person in the Western world that's uh, living in America, or Australia, Great Britain and the like is getting one calorie out of 20 calories that comes from whole food. So fruits, vegetables, nuts, beans, seeds and whole grains. Right. Just one calorie out of 20. Now, I don't even think I was at that. I was probably at one out of 100. So my life was just processed food and animal product and mm -hmm. plenty of uh, alcohol and soda. Probably more soda than alcohol, but, you know, that was – I wasn't drinking much water. That, that was my lifestyle basically from 18 right up until 40. So I, I'd, I'd done 22 years of just smashing my system. And yeah. so it, it's no wonder when you put it in that perspective that I broke. Yeah. And I, I, I often talk to many people out there that have broken as well. And I'm sure there's many people listening to us that at some stage of their life, they have broken and maybe they're still broken. And what those words which I'm talking about will ring true, that it's very rare you'll find somebody who lives on a focused on plants and makes plants the priority in their life for consumption that is broken. It does happen. Don't get me wrong. It's not mm -hmm. like not like the silver bullet. Right. But the number of people that have chronic disease and illness when they're young that are plant based uh, compared to the ones who aren't plant based is chalk and cheese. The the the, the, the difference is a country mile. So right. going back to the idea of going road, I had this decision to make at the age of forty. Well, I've got okay. So what am I going to do? Because it wasn't like I hadn't been told that I was fat. It wasn't like I hadn't been told that I was sick. It wasn't like I had been told that I was close to putting myself in grave danger and at risk. So it was like at, at this point, I had, to, I had to really decide what is it that I'm going to focus on and how am I going to get out of this, right? Mm -hmm, and, right. and I think that personal conversation, that internal conversation that I had, what it did is it, it opened up my ears to listening. Whereas before I was pretty closed off and a bit like focused on, no, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll get through this. And it, it's hard to describe it, but, but it was all, I was shut down to outside advice and thought. Mm -hmm. and, and the more I heard outside, the more I shut down, the more I dug in, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So after that honest conversation in the mirror, that conversation where I was having a, a conversation back and forth with myself, I, I really, uh, the, the big shift that happened was that my ears opened up and I was willing and, and, I, and open to taking information in to sort of look at myself in a, in a very objective, honest way. I think honest is the key word there. Yes. And one of the first things I heard was um, from Professor Ron Penny, who said that 70% of all disease is caused by lifestyle choices, okay? Yeah. Now, if you think about that, that's an enormous amount of pain and suffering and illness and lost productivity um, and sorrow and all sorts of depression. You just think about 70% of all, all of this chronic disease out there. And so I started to look at what are these lifestyle choices like, you know, what are they that are, that are causing all of this? And it turns out there are six big ones. There's obviously if you smoke, there's what you eat and drink. It's how much you move or don't move. It's what kind of sleep you get. It's how you manage your stress. And it's how you're connected in, into friends. And do you have, you know, strong connection and love in your sure. life? Right. And, and these big six, like – I was only successful on one of them, Laurie, and that was the last one. I mean, <laughs> the other five, I was failing miserably. Right. So, so now, you, now Rome wasn't built in a day, and I didn't think that I could take all of that on in one hit. So I just stopped the smoking, 
pretty much pretty much after I turned 40. So before I embarked on the journey, I pretty much had to deal with the smoking first. So it was, it was about a couple of months. Uh, it was about, let me just make sure I got this right. Yeah, it was about two months after I turned 40 that I gave away the smokes, okay? Okay, okay. Um, and then... Uh, then the then it wasn't for another. Uh, actually, I, I've actually got my dates wrong. That's wrong. I gave up the smokes a couple of months after turning forty one. So that's right. It took me longer than I thought. Right. I had some stop starts, but actually, finally kicking them was two months after I turned forty one. Then three months later is when I started my journey. So it took me about 18 months to get my act together to work out what I was going to do. Now, you okay. might say, why did it take so long? Because I really wanted to look at all areas and I sort of made it like a startup. I, I sort of took control back of my health mm -hmm. and I started focusing as though I was the CEO of my own health. I was good at solving problems in business. I'd started up seven or eight companies. So I just sort of assumed that position. And okay. like anything with a startup, you just don't jump in. You really work out what you're going to do, what's your plan, how's this going to be executed, what other alternatives are there, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, la da 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 da. You go through it like like a business. Well, which which makes sense, and and that I think people that don't do that, which is most people that decide they're going to change their eating lifestyle, uh, they don't do that which means they can't sustain the new change they want to make because they haven't, they haven't done all of the work and, and planned out a s strategy that can, you know, best set them up for success. So I think that was so brilliant that you took the time to do that. Yeah, well, I really wanted to investigate because I, I'd, I'd had enough. I mean, you know, it wasn't like I didn't do anything about my health between 32 and 40. I tried a lot of things, Laurie. I mean, you know, I did mud huts, I did acupuncture, I did, you know, I did all these things, mm -hmm. like, you know, taking my blood out, spinning in a machine, putting it back into me. I did all this stuff, but nothing worked. And the one thing deep down at the core, the real core, I knew that the food that I was eating was very, very, very problematic and suboptimal. Sure. But it was such a security blanket for me. It was so, it was so important to me that I just didn't want to let it go. I didn't want it to be true, if that uh, makes sense. Sure. You were emotionally connected to those, to that food uh, style of eating, right? Uh, absolutely. And I think that goes back to when I was, I was bullied at school. Um, you know, the sugar at, at, at lunchtime when, when I was sitting by myself as a young boy, sugar was my best friend. Sugar, yeah. made, me, sugar made me feel good and it made me feel better about myself. So I think the reliance on sugar started at a very young age that it was my it was my safety net. Mm -hmm. um, so and I think that when you grow when you grow that habit and you grow that pathway to happiness, um, that that when stress comes in your life, even to today, even still to today, um, I, I'm able to recognize it more. Now it doesn't mean I'm perfect. But I'm able to recognize it more. Yeah. But but I hadn't recognized it until that point. Mm -hmm. So so this idea of going um, to plants was um, was pretty much based on the idea of this connection that we have with Mother Nature and how vital it is to our existence on planet Earth. It was it, you know I've always been fascinated about. Um, science and stars and uh, the cosmos. I remember as a young boy, you know, reading a lot of stuff about going to the moon and the planets and how stars are made. And I, I would just consume anything about that. And, you know, how like, like I was always fascinated that the nearest star would take like the light would take three and a half years to reach my eyes. So when I was looking at that star, it could already have blown up and I didn't know about it. Just little things like that made me in awe and in wonder of the world around me. And so when I brought it closer to home and I started to sort of see that all of this greenery, all of these trees, the grass, um, flowers, you know, vegetables that were at the supermarket that I'd never really given much consideration to, mm -hmm. that they were all plants that, that came basically from the atmosphere, the water, 
the nutrients in the soil and the sun and this kind of magic of growth and of a seedling spawning this um this uh this um, magical nutrition um but also something of beauty it really shifted my my thinking about what I had been doing, and effectively, I was taking Mother Nature's finest, and I was allowing it to go through a processed um, machinery where it was heated, where it was burned, where it was boiled, where it was it was yeah. uh, fried. Um, sure. It was it completely was altered. Completely altered, altered to the fact where it was just taking the macronutrients out of the plant. So it was taking the fat, the carbohydrate, and the protein. But, but leaving behind the micronutrients, which are the vitamins, minerals, and the tens of thousands of other phytochemicals that are found at this micro level. And so that, that abstinence of those micronutrients, I felt very strongly was the reason that my body wasn't communicating because I had a communication problem. I mean, my brain was getting wrong signals. It was getting dummy signals from my nervous system. So mm -hmm. I, I viewed it very much as though my brain was not communicating with my body well. So there had to be something in the in the comms network. Mm -hmm. So I had a wobbly in there and I need to find out what it is. And and after research and reading and listening and talking, I, I kind of got my mind pretty much set on the idea that these phytonutrients uh, not only provide, um, well, well, plants, not only provide the macro, like they'll have protein, they'll have carbohydrate, they'll have fat like an avocado does, for example, but they also have this magical um, phytonutrients which provide the information. So they're not really energy. It's not like an energy that'll help you win a marathon or run faster, but it's an energy or a, or a, a life source that enables the cells to communicate better with one another. And I knew I needed that. So this was a huge breakthrough in my mindset that I felt that I had found a solution to the problem specific to me. Now, obviously, since then, I've learned that most chronic disease is a communication problem. That's mm -hmm. what most of it is. It's cells not communicating with one another and going rogue, to use your language, right? Yeah, yeah. And cells go rogue and start doing their own thing. You know, we call that cancer. So yeah. I basically realized that I needed to go back to Mother Nature. I needed to knock on her door I hadn't seen her for 22 years, basically <laughs> since I left mum's cooking at home, and I need to go and reintroduce myself. And of course, Mother Nature will have you back. She's like that, but you know, she doesn't want to see talk. She wants to see action. It's all about action, Laurie. Yes. So yeah. I needed to set myself down, and how am I going to go about this action-wise? And you know, if you've done 22 years of crime, <clears throat> two days of eating plants isn't going to help. So I decided that I would sort of do a two-year sort of commitment on plants to see if this would help my condition. So that was going to take care of the sick part, but I was still fat. And I actually thought the idea of fasting is something that I had done a lot of work on, a lot of research on, a lot of reading on. And this is water fasting that I was focused on. Mm -hmm. And then I sort of came to this happy medium of, well, I'm going to go on these plants for two years. What about if I just drank the juice from plants for the first 60 days of my two year journey. Okay. And so that's where the idea of a juice fast sort of merged and came together. It wasn't, don't get me wrong, I'm not claiming that it was my original idea by any means, but I took a lot of tools that were out there and made them mine. I, I merged things to mm -hmm. make it mine so that I felt ownership of it. Okay. And so the 60 days, so that was actually one of my questions was why, you know, what compelled you to do a, a 60 day juice fast? You know, why not 10 days or 30 days? You know, did 60, that was just like a, like an intuitive number that came to you and you just decided Correct. that's why. Well, based on doing two years of plants and based on 22 years of the abstinence of micronutrients, I just felt that the best bet that I had was to really supercharge my system with what had been so lacking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, originally it was going to be 30 days and then I sort of got my mind set on 40 days. But then 40 days seemed too biblical and my initials were already JC. So I thought, you know what, i got to push this. i got to go 60. 
And yeah. any talk of 90 that I had, everyone thought I was crazy. They already, they already thought I was crazy doing 60. But uh-huh. that seemed like a safe enough number um, given what I had looked at. And so I felt, I felt pretty confident that that would be a safe number and also an achievable number. I mean, mm-hmm. don't get me wrong, it was really hard, but I thought it was achievable. Yeah, I mean, you know, it that that would be hard, especially based on, you know, the lifestyle that you'd had up until that point. And then uh, when you when you decided to document the whole process, you know, I'm watching you uh, have your juice and, you know, being around some people or in some restaurants where, you know, they're having kind of the typical food. Uh, and I was like, wow, you are an oak to be. <laughs> to be that strong and be able to resist, um, you know, kind of falling back and, uh, or giving yourself a pass and eating some of that food that you were around and looking at and people were eating around you, uh, you know, smelling it. And you yeah. were just solid with your juice. And I was like, man, that's amazing. Yeah. Look, it was, um, I'm not going to lie. It was, it was really tough, but I, I have to say I had a couple of things going for me. Number one, was that I knew that this was kind of like my last sort of roll of the dice to get off these meds and to get well. I figured that if I failed in this and couldn't complete what the task that I'd set myself after so much preparation and psyching myself up and sharing what I was going to do with the world, and you know, mm. it would have been a, a, a bigger failure in not achieving it than actually being sick. So. Mm-hmm. There was that. There was also the fact that I had put a camera on myself, you know, and I, yeah. I, I did that I did that for two reasons. Number one, to help me, like, through it, but also to share what I was doing because I, I felt that I wasn't alone in the, the state that I was in. In yeah. fact, I, I was the majority, not the minority, okay? Yep. Um, so, so those two things. So I, I also, the third thing I did, is I started to imagine people watching the film. I, I created two personas. I created a, uh, a woman in Philadelphia, and don't, don't ask me why I chose Philadelphia, but I, I chose a, a woman who worked in an AT&T call center in Philadelphia, okay? Mm-hmm. I, I just created in my mind that these people would come home and they'd be watching me on this movie and they would have these issues or some kind of an issue and that they'd be rooting for me to make sure that I could do it. Right? Uh-huh. Yeah. And then I and then I created the persona of a of a guy. Now I didn't have a state for him, but it was like a, a rural guy, like a guy in the country who was sort of sort of hard day in the paddock, came up, put his feet up on the on the on the coffee table watching it while he was having a beer. Uh-huh. You know? So I was sort of creating these two um that these people would be going supporting me. So it was kind of like a, it was like a virtual or a imaginative support network, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, what a good idea. I mean, just another great tool or resource to uh, to keep you motivated to hold you to hold yourself accountable because you felt like now other people were depending on you to succeed. Absolutely, and and, and I knew that in myself that you know I knew that these meds and the direction that I was heading was was to a very early grave. I just didn't think I would make it to 80 or 90 or anything like that if mm-hmm. I didn't make a change. So so I go and do it. I film it. Um, the filming part, that came late. That wasn't like the main idea. That, that was very late that, you know, a buddy of mine said, you should film this. You're the most least likely guy to do something like this. And mm-hmm. I said, okay, well, we'll throw a camera on. And that was what I just explained, one of the benefits of putting the camera in. Then I... Um, I basically did the 60 days. I then did three months of plants. And lo and behold, I didn't need to do two years. I mean, that's the funny part about this. Within five months, I was off all medication and I was 100 pounds lighter. Really? I had to, technically, I was 90 pounds lighter, technically. I, I rounded up to 100 because it sounds better, but it was like 90. <laughs> it, it, it was actually the, the specific number was was like 89 pounds is where I got to after after I, I lost 82 pounds on the 60-day fast. But then three months later after eating plants, I was 89 pounds sort of down. 
And so I'd gone from 309 on day one to 220. Now, once I started eating again, the 220 pretty much went to 240. Like when I say eating normally again, I stayed at 240 for, for you know, quite a long time after that. It, it, didn't, it didn't go back up quick or anything like that. It stayed at that number. Um, there was always going to be a bounce off the low because you're juicing as opposed to eating. And I knew that and I accepted that. So, I, But the weight part, while it was a win, the real win that I was that I was off the medication and didn't need any pills or anything at all. And in fact, you know, that was, that was in uh, March of 2008 mm -hmm. when, when, when that happened. And what are we now? We're in 2020. So we're, uh, we're over 12 years ago, and I haven't taken any meds since that day. And so except, the disease went away? Oh, yeah. No, I don't have it at all. But I'm talking about, I'm talking about not taking any meds at all, Laurie. I'm yeah. talking about no, no pills in my life except okay. for three courses of antibiotics that I've had to take, and two of those with tooth infections. And the other one, unfortunately, I inhaled oil while I was in Spain, and I had a bit of an asthma. I'm not an asthma, but I had like a reaction for inhaling oil. I, I did a hiccup while I was having a salad, which had oil on it, would you believe it? And mm. um, it went down my lung. I don't know if you ever had oil go down your lung, but it ain't pretty. No. So uh, I, I needed a drip, and the drip had antibiotics. So I, I, I just used that as an example, that 12 years of someone who had previously for eight years taken pills three times a day, at, some mostly, but most, but so mostly two times a day, and at times three times a day, to not having anything at all, you know, in mm -hmm. basically 12 years. So um, it's a, it's, it was a huge, huge win from that point of view. Now, I, I would say to you, if I went back to my old ways, um, I'm pretty confident that, that this illness would, would rear its ugly head again. I'm not saying that I'm like cured, what I, the way I think about it is, is that I'm healthy enough now that that weakness doesn't have any strength in me. If, I don't know if, if that's yeah. sort of logic. Well, it seems like, yeah, if, that, if that's something that you are kind of predisposed to, because there's a lot of people that have the lifestyle that you had that don't, that maybe, uh, you know, it manifests itself in other uh, forms of illness or disease, but not that particular one. So it seems like that was like a, a vulnerable point for you. But now um, you're not doing anything to trigger it anymore. Correct. And, and I do believe that if you have fibromyalgia, if you suffer migraines, if you have eczema, whatever it is, whatever chronic disease you have the way i think about it is that that's the weakest link in your chain that's the weakest link so whatever you're doing it's going to manifest itself at the weakest link sure so i don't necessarily think that all of those diseases are, are, are unrelated i think they are related mm -hmm. i think they all come back to this central sorry i won't say all i'm going to say 70 percent. i'm going to stick with the data I'm going to say 70% of them come back to our personal responsibilities of actions that we take that promote that inflammation. Generally, it's an inflammation of some kind in the body that causes so much of this um, this, this heartbreaking pain for so many people. Right. I, I completely agree with you on that. And one of the things I want to ask you then um, – just to back up a little bit, is you saw what like countless doctors, right? Both allopathic as well as practitioners of alternative medicine, and nothing worked, right? And and Correct. none of those people, none of those people, even the even the alternative medicine people, nobody suggested that you do an extreme diet overhaul. So they said I need to improve my diet. Uh -huh. But they never, they never, they never told me to go rogue, Laurie. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's basically your going rogue point was when you s decided that you were just going to sort of, uh, I guess, rotate uh, away from from all of that stuff and and I guess use your own um, research um, and intuition and go down this really extreme by what most people would consider yeah. a, a, an extreme if path. I, if I had to put it down to a single moment, 
it would be when I ceased outsourcing my health to other people and I became the CEO of it. That would be the moment when, That's it. when I brought it in-house. That's perfect. And that is that is so important, I think, for for people to to get is that, you know, you just can't you just can't give the responsibility of your health away to everyone else, to, you know, to well-meaning family members who think they have, you know, the latest great diet or to the doctor who's really not all that trained in nutrition and, and even some alternative, you know, practitioners that are well-intended, but, um, you know, sometimes they just, they don't have what you need. And I think it's so important for people to, to take this into account, you know, what you did, you just decided I am going to take this complete responsibility for where I'm at. I'm honest about how I got here. And now I'm going to do something radical and I'm going to turn this thing around. At least, at least then I'll know, you know, I've left no t stone unturned, so to speak. I mean, what do you have to lose by trying? Correct. And I think that, you know, the world that we're living in today, there's such, you know, for, if, if you sort of think about what's happening in our world around us, it's, it's quite tumultuous right now. I mean, 2020, you know, 2020 wasn't in the brochure of what we all signed up for. And right. it's, it's one of these things where the lesson what happened to me on this micro level of taking personal responsibility, I actually firmly believe that so many of the problems in the world today around us can be solved by simply all of us taking more personal responsibility. And I, I, I really firmly believe that, and I really firmly believe that, that most of these problems can be solved if we start with our own health. It's, it really is at the epicenter of so mm -hmm. many of the bigger issues we have in our lives. And yeah. when you look at the, the US GDP of $3.5 trillion on healthcare, it's, it's mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's of, a, that's of an 18, that was when it was an 18 trillion, $19 trillion economy. So I don't know, what's the math on that? That's like 15% of the total GDP of the United States, the largest economy in the world. 15 bucks of every hundred dollars is going on health care. Mm -hmm. This is this is insanity levels. Yeah. When seventy percent of all of that is lifestyle choices. So just imagine a world where personal responsibility shine through. And that's not that's not an unrealistic goal to aim for, Lori. That's not that's not unrealistic to say no. that. No, and, and it's, it's not. It, and, and then the other thing is, if you don't want to look at it from a mathematic or dollar point of view, just think about how many people are in nursing homes and hospitals and all this with their grandkids and their kids having to take up valuable time out of their weekend to come and visit them. I mean, you know, it's also quite selfish. So, I, I, and I'm, and I, you know, people say, well, that's a bit harsh, Joe. No, I don't think it's a bit harsh because... Yeah. A year of choices, uh, sorry, a lifetime of choices will put you in a position like that. I'll go back to it. You cannot ignore the biological laws of cause and effect. Yeah. So, yeah. so there is a personal responsibility. If you truly, truly love your children, if you love your parents, if you love your partner, you don't want them to see you in pain. That's the right. last thing you want. So, so I really believe that this is something that the shift that you're talking about in each week when you talk about a shift, this mm -hmm. is a it's one of the single biggest positive shifts a person can make is take responsibility of that, what I call the last two feet of freedom, the distance between your hand and your mouth. And no one should get in the middle of that. I don't want to be between you and your, your hand and your mouth, Laura. You don't want to be between mine. That's right. not for someone to tell you what to do. Well, yeah. we don't want that. But to have the awareness of the personal responsibility is everything. It is 
and and then to act on it because i mean going back to your film again it is it's amazing how many people that you spoke with who were overweight and have health issues uh, that when you ask them if they know what they should do to get better and they all answer yes change the way i eat so but they don't so they know yeah. what they have to do it's not like they're not aware they know it but they just you know, they, they choose not to, or they can't, or, you know, they, but they, whatever the reason is, I'm sure they all have their own, but they just don't do it. And then yeah, I've spent it, a lot of time thinking about that situation. I've, I've even called it a term. I call it, I call it Kivdi, K-I-V-D-I, knowing it versus doing it. Okay? Ah, yep. And, That's a and good I one. think that this is a phenomenon, which is, huge not only in in diet but it's in most things in life yeah we have the knowledge or we have we know that it it's going to help we may not know how to implement it but we know it but we just don't do it so if you focus on the doing part i think that's the area we need to focus on why isn't the doing it happening and i've mm -hmm. spoken to countless people i call them new nutritional gatekeepers all right laurie people who it's generally the mum, but quite often it can be the dad uh -huh. who is the person who does the shopping for the household okay whoever yep. whoever goes to the market they are what's called the nutritional gatekeeper for the family right because whatever they put in their grocery uh trolley to put in the in the fridge or in the pantry at home that's what the family's going to eat, okay? So if you don't put the Oreos in the basket, they don't make it into the house, they don't find their way into the stomach, mm -hmm. right? So it's this nutritional gatekeepers. They go into stores with the best of intentions. They walk into the bulk section. They work into the fresh food section, but they just don't know what to do. They don't know how to spend their money wisely enough to prepare a meal, to cook a meal that they know the family's going to eat. They right. don't want to be failures. They don't want to make a mistake. They, they, money is tight. So they go to what they know, where they right. know they're going to feed kids. They're going to get a meal on the table that there's not going to be any complaints about. So right. there, is, there is a certain amount of risk involved from a personal reputation, from a financial, from a, from a, how, a self esteem in making those shifts. And as you and I both know, from our own experiences, talking to people and probably from your own self, it takes time for those taste buds to adjust. Yeah. It, it takes time. And also, it's a lot more work. See, most people leave supermarkets with meals as opposed to leaving with ingredients. Exactly. And exactly. this idea of ingredients is a much more controlled way of living where you know what's going in. You can control the sugar, the fat, and the salt. Those yep. three major sort of addictive uh, uh, ingredients in our food. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It's, a, and it is, it's a fascinating uh, area, but the one thing that I try to do is I try to make sure that I people who know me know me that I'm not a fanatic. See, I don't think there's any place for fanaticism in our society. I don't, I don't, I don't think it works anywhere. Okay, yeah. I, I yeah. really believe that our personalities, our creatures, we are we are people that need we 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 need sadness, we need happiness, we need sleep, we need to be awake, we need night, we need day, we need cold, we need hot, and we need food that's going to make us feel great, like you know a piece of cake, and we need food like kale that's going to keep us strong, and yeah. it's not. A matter of saying I can't have cake. It's a matter of I need to make sure I have lots and lots and lots of the veggies, the fruits, the nuts, the beans, the seeds, the whole grains, so that when I have my cake, I really can enjoy it. It's guilt free and it's fun to have. But you yeah. ask anybody, if I said to you, Laurie, what's the funnest thing you love doing? What would that be? If I said, what's the funnest thing that you love doing? Either could be hiking, could be something. What would it be? Yeah, well, you know, there's going to be a couple of things, but at the top of the list, it's enjoying food. 
Okay, so if if I if you said to me, right, Joe, I love food. That's my favorite thing. Well, if I made you eat food for like three weeks straight for every minute of the day without any sleep, you wouldn't be able to do it, number one, and it would cease to be fun, right? So there's this idea that whatever we love doing, if we do too much of it, it's not fun anymore. And so the foods that most people are living on, I call them entertainment foods. Yeah. They're like in what the fun part of town, but there's the essential part of town and the fun part of town. But too many people spend all their time in the fun part of town, and it's not fun anymore. And right. that's, we've got to we've got to get our mentality so that we can we can participate there. It's not the end of the world. It's not never, never, never. It's just got to we've got to spend some more time in what I call the essential part of town: the fruits, the vegetables, nuts, beans, seeds, whole grains. Yeah, yeah, and I, and that's my philosophy too. It's it's uh, the the rule is all of the good stuff, and then the exception to the rule is you know the occasional piece of cake or the treat that you want to have, and then you can enjoy it, and you can enjoy it without guilt. You can enjoy it without having to you know agonize over even making the choice. And then beating yourself up because you think you made the bad one, um, and you can um, y- you won't suffer any negative results because of it. It's something that you can, like you say, have fun with. Um, but if that's that's the exception to the rule, but most people have flipped it, and uh, and that's the rule. And so the fun food and the fun part of town, as you as you call it, I love that is is now the usual the usual way of living, the usual way of eating. And once in a while, maybe they throw in something like, you know, an anemic salad and think that they're doing yeah. something healthy. Um, yeah. And it's just and not, more, a, it's just not enough. Time, the more time you spend there, the more addictive it yeah. becomes. And yeah. you uh, have great difficulty getting to the heights of the enjoyment that you had when you first went there. And right. this, this is why fasting and particularly juice fasting as well, have huge, huge impacts on people's lives because what it does, it provides a reset. It gives this, it's like a circuit breaker. You all of a sudden are dramatically taken out of this environment where you're consuming nothing but processed food to a world where you're just drinking water that's been trapped through mother nature in plants and you're extracting out this water from a carrot, this water from a cucumber, water from a celery. And when that water comes out, it comes out as a certain color, comes out as orange from a carrot or green from a celery. And and the reason why it has a color to it, that's the phytonutrients, phyto, light, light nutrients. And the way that the light refracts off those molecules is that the light is absorbing every color spectrum except the green or except the orange. And that's what it reflects back to us. So Mm. that's how you know that in juice, you are actually seeing the color is the micronutrients. That's what it is. Mm. And I always always sort of share this. People ask me, what's the best juice for this, Joe? What's the best juice for that? The simple reality is the best juice that you can have a green, red, purple, yellow, and orange. And you want to try and get as much of that color rainbow into you because each each color has different compounds, has different molecular structure that is mm-hmm. all vital to our communications platform within our, right. within our molecular structure. Right. And those the that juice, that fresh pressed, awesome, beautiful juice is it's alive. And that's that I think is something that people don't think about the what they're missing out when they don't uh, have a fresh juice or have, you know, um, raw plants is there the other food that they're eating that's cooked and the processed food it's, it's dead. You know, there's, there's not much life sustaining nutrition left in most of that food. And so these, you know, and that's, let's just go into some of the other wonderful um, benefits of having fresh juice. I'm going to let you do that. Sure. Well, I think the, it, well, I want to, I want to make a difference between adding juice to your daily life, which mm-hmm. I recommend for everybody. Mm-hmm. So, so we all, 
we all know if I saw, I, I, I go out to speak to people in crowds and I always say, what's the best thing you can drink and what's the worst thing you can drink? And everybody gets the best one, right? They always say water. And when I ask them what's the worst thing, they all say Coca-Cola. And mm -hmm. I say, no, petrol. If you drink petrol, you'll die. So <laughs> I, I look at it from a spectrum of uh -huh. best and the worst. Now, water is right up. That was a joke, by the way. Water <laughs> I is I got it. Top. <laughs> I know. Uh, it probably works better in a crowd. But right up there at the top is water. And next to water, right next to water, is fresh juice. It's it's like really what fresh juice is. It's virtually 99.8 or 99.7% water. And you have that colouring of those micronutrients. So when you drink that, your body doesn't necessarily have to spend a lot of time digesting it. Whereas if you eat carrots, if you eat celery, you are putting an enormous amount of fiber into your body. Now, this is important for people to understand. Fiber is absolutely essential for good health, good microbiome health. We love fiber. Joe is not against fiber. Right. However, however, there's a trade-off here that I want people to understand, okay? If yep. I gave you five sticks of celery, Laurie, to eat, you are going to be doing, uh, if those celery sticks are six inches long, you're going to be, uh, for each stick, you're going to have about, in the ballpark of 300 chews, up and down your mouth chewing to try and consume one celery stick. So if I give you five, you're doing 1,500 bites, chewing up and down your bottom jaw to your top, back and forth, back and forth. Studies have shown that if you eat 400 calories of carrots, you burn 100 calories just eating them. Okay? <laughs> so right. in terms of the amount of nutrition you can get into your body, if you take five celery sticks and juice them and drink that juice, you have taken – now, you're not going to get 100%, but if you have a really good cold-pressed juicer – you have a really good one, you can get between 80 and 90% of the nutrition out of the celery because the, the, the fiber isn't nutrition. The fiber comes out the back door. The fiber right. is not, it's not, it's not put into the bloodstream. The fiber doesn't go to your cells. It's not the basis of energy. Fiber is nature's delivery system of the nutrition. It's not the nutrition. Mm -hmm. Fiber is excellent for the bowel, cleaning out the bowel, fauna in the bowel. So well, I'm not saying don't have fiber. I'm saying have a large green juice or a purple juice or a red juice and also eat lots of salad and, yes, eat lots of fiber. So Yeah, exactly. I want to, I want to explain that a juice is an absolutely unique way to supercharge your micronutrient intake. That's if you're doing it on a daily basis, all right? Mm -hmm. So now mm -hmm. let's shift to someone on juice fast. Well, on a juice fast, you don't need the fiber because you're not eating anything else, okay? You're, the, the enough, there's enough microfiber, what we call soluble fiber in the juice to perform all sorts of fantastic functions to make sure that you're going to the bathroom because mm -hmm. anyone on a juice fast will tell you, depending on how poor your diet's been. If you've had a poor diet, you ain't going to leave the house for the first two or three days. You're, right, going, to be, right. you're, you're going to be going to the bathroom quite a lot. And it, in the end, it's going to feel like water's just coming out because you are really giving yourself a flush. Right, now, right. for those that have a pretty good diet going in, they're not going to have that issue at all. Also, those people whose diet are strong, they're going to have less withdrawal symptoms. They're not going to feel the sugar hit or the caffeine hit, all of that, they're, they're going to feel much easier transition into juicing. As opposed mm -hmm. to those who have a poor diet, they're really going to struggle. And if you right, go back right. to the movie, I couldn't get out of bed for the first two days. That's how bad my diet was beforehand. I was, mm -hmm. I felt like a semi-trailer or it just run over me or a locomotive train, it just smashed me. I was just out. Wow. So, so during this period while you're just drinking juice, you are actually – not needing to turn on the normal digestive functions of your body. You're not 
you're not having to to create a lot of enzymes in your gut and your stomach to digest food. You're not breaking down a lot. Remember, when you if if, if you've ever been a runner, Laurie, if, you, if you've ever run. Anyone who's run will tell you that if, if they're five miles into a into a race, and and no matter how much they love food, if someone came up and said, "Here's about here's a couple of avocados, some tomatoes, a stick of celery, some carrots," even though it's all good stuff, there's no way they can eat that while they're running because all the blood that's needed for digestion is in their arms and legs. Mm-hmm. But they drink water. It's very simple for them to drink because there isn't any digestion required. It's exactly the same with juice because remember it's 99.8 percent water so they can drink a juice while they're running because they don't need the whole digestion process to take place so this is key to understand that you are giving that part of your system a rest and a break and you're mimicking a water fast here which now is going to create a whole bunch of other chain reactions in your body, which is the breaking down of cellular function or of, of cellular cells that are old, that are worn, that are not needed anymore. We call this thing called autophagy. I don't know if you've heard of it, but mm-hmm. autophagy. And anyone interested can Google that autophagy. And that is the breaking down of old cells that are not needed, saving some material putting the rest into the system to be metabolized and then constructing and building new cellular structure. And we we really do autophagy at a we, we, we're, we're doing it all the time, Laurie, but we really speed up the process when we do two things. When we exercise at a at a um, uh, anaerobic level, at a, sorry, at an aerobic level, and we do it when we fast. They're the two ways we really speed up autophagy. So that's mm-hmm. that's kind of like your spring clean. Of your right. system. Right. So, Not- so your body is going to need to, metabolism is about digestion and self and the engine turning on. It's, it's, it's about converting life. And you, when you fast, you still convert life. You just take it from areas that are the least needed on your body. You're not going to digest your eye or your tongue or your liver or your lung because your body is too smart. It knows it needs that. It's going to digest the stuff it needs the least. It's, it's like, let's go around the body, let's look at all the stuff we don't need, and let's throw that in, and let's burn that for fuel. Right, so right. That's something that happens during a fast. The other big benefit that happens is that a lot of foods that many, many people eat, they don't realize this, but they have a slight, a minor intolerance to. There are so many chemicals in our food that... We don't know which is which, but they create little little um, in, inflammatory or little intolerances that then lead to bigger inflammation. So right now, I'm on day 23 of what I'm calling a hybrid reboot. So for the past 22 days, because it's morning for me on day 23, but for the past 22 days, I've lived on having a plant-based smoothie. So that's that's like frozen banana, a handful of spinach, strawberries with almond milk, a couple of dates blended. So I'm mm-hmm. actually getting lots of fiber, and that's really digestion. That's not juicing. That's blending, okay? But then I switch into four to five, depending on my day, fresh pressed juices that I make at home. And then I finish off the night with a green soup, a greens soup, okay? Okay. And okay. So I've effectively been plant-based, zero processed food for 22 days. And I can tell you that the inflammation levels in my body are so low. I, I just know, I mean, I'm 54 years of age now. And, you know, as you get older, your knees, your hips, things, they, they just, unfortunately, they're just not like they were in your 20s. It's just like Right. I hear and, you. But I can tell you now, this last... You know, it takes about five days for the real benefits to kick in. So the last sort of two weeks, I I, I have had incredible mobility, and I and I, I I don't know what it is in the in the because my diet is not highly processed, but I certainly do enjoy bread and things like that. And I don't know what it is, but there are certain things in my diet that when I do have too much, it does 
kick in to cause inflammation. So mm -hmm. it's just a great example. When you do reboot like that and you do you do something that's plant-based, and I, I haven't gone all the way like I did in the past. I do that. For, I, I'm actually just trying something different this time, Laurie. I'm just seeing how this one affects me because I like to experiment. Yeah. But it, it, it's just it, – it, that's – that's probably the biggest benefit that I can say to people. And then anyone who's got a chronic illness or disease, I don't think, thanks, thank, thank God, but anyone who does would also see dramatic shifts in that. They may not cure it, but they'll see less pain, less, less inflammation, and, mm -hmm. and, and they'll be shocked at just how much better it will improve. Right. Now, if somebody wants to try something like what you just described or, you know, a 30 or a 60 day juice fast like you did in your documentary, do you suggest that they do this in um, in accordance with with their doctor's um, approval or is it do you think it's safe for people to do it on their own? What are your thoughts about so, that? So my rule of thumb is that if you're not on medication, then doing 10 days is absolutely fine. I mean, you're not gonna you're not gonna find yourself in any trouble, and that's we've we've found this after after basically ten years of our community mm -hmm. and speaking to many doctors and all the advice I've had. You're not gonna find anyone who doesn't take meds. Okay, this is someone who who, who doesn't take any medication doing ten days, not a problem. Okay, anybody who who doesn't take meds who wants to go beyond ten days particularly if they're kicking more than 15, then we encourage them to add a plant-based protein into their juice, like at each per day. We have found that, that there is not enough protein in the juice, particularly for women. So we have had a number of women who have reported hair loss by not putting protein into their juice, okay? Okay, okay so, like a protein supplement, you mean? Correct, like a, okay. like a pea protein okay. powder. Right, and, got it. And mixing it in. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, if you take any type of medication whatsoever, then it's automatic mandated. You need to speak to your healthcare provider. Now, on my website, rebootwithjoe.com, we have a we have a page you can print out to take to your doctor, which actually has all the questions and explains written by my medical advisory board about everything that's going on, so that then a doctor who doesn't understand this or doesn't know what's going on can actually read it and understand what it is okay. because because essentially what we're doing is that you know we are still a, a person who does a juice fast <clears throat> is never it, it has never ever got that much micronutrient value into their body ever in that short of period of time right um, there is still carbohydrates that are going in because the juice is a carbohydrate. Right. Because there are sugars in in juice. So you're just not having uh, fat, but you are having some protein. So there is a very small amount of protein and there is carbohydrate. Okay. So I often speak to doctors and say, <clears throat> what's better, going to Las Vegas and eating at the buffet for seven days or having a juice fast for seven days? And there's no comparison. Juice fast <laughs> much better than going to Vegas. <laughs> right. It and, and it's probably less expensive at the end of the seven days, right? Much more, much less, much less expensive, and also, you know, you're giving your you're giving. Well, the way I think about it is, I'm giving my body a vacation, as yeah. opposed to me having the vacation. Right. It's my. It's, it's my internal organs and body that I'm giving the vacation to. You know, I, I, I can't, I can't uh, emphasize it enough that all of us, we need to look after our organs as like, you know how people love their dogs and their cats and they just do anything for them? Mm -hmm. I want people to think like that about their organs. Yep. Because at the end of the day, your organs are what is going to determine your longevity on this planet. You know, right. yes, I know car accidents happen and buses and all of that, sure. But, you know, that's not to do with your organs in terms of, you know, your longevity. Um, mm -hmm. 
But if just barring accidents and bad luck, it's the organs for most of us that we need to keep in great shape. And, you know, there's, there's lots of ways that we can tax our organs too much over time. Eating, eating from the moment you wake up to going to bed is a great way of taxing your organs too much. Um, not getting enough sleep is a great way of taxing your organs. Uh, being majorly stressed is a great way of taxing your organs. Mm-hmm. Smoking cigarettes. Oh, yeah, let's, let's put a tax on our lungs. So let's right. smoke cigarettes. Um, and then, of course, eating lots of food that is high in, high in fat, um, very big fried foods where we're putting a lot of carcinogens into our body, free radicals. Um, you know, that, that's a great way to tax our organs. So if we just think about it in that light, that we need to really give love and nourish and care for our organs, that that's where juicing and juice fasting and doing what I'm doing now on day 23, that these are the kinds of, of images that I manifest when I'm, when I'm doing this. And, you know, even though it's tough going and I'm looking forward to, you know, my first vegetarian pizza and I'm looking forward to, to having, a, you know, a, a vegetable wrap and all these things I'm excited about. Mm-hmm. I still, I still just say, right, that's coming. You know, it's one week away, and you know, there's going to be plenty of weeks ahead in my life. And how right. many weeks have I bought, or how many months have I bought for my life by doing this for the last thirty days when it's done? Do you know what I mean? So that's how. Yeah, I- yeah, yeah. I and that's that's so great to point that out because it seems that. Um, and actually, this is this is leads back to another scene, um, a clip in the in the movie where uh, I think you were in New York and you were explaining to various people what you were doing. And there was uh, there was a a woman. Um, she was quite uh, she was young and she was quite overweight. And you explained to her what you were doing, and she said, "That's crazy." And I was like, "Isn't it interesting how it is that people who are actually you know, they don't consciously know this, but they're actually running toward ill health and all manner of disease by way of their lifestyle, their eating lifestyle, which seems like the ultimate crazy behavior. But, but like that woman in particular, who represents a lot of people think that what you are doing or what you did in order to return to good health was crazy. And it's just, it's so interesting to me how people think that doing something like what you did or, you know, something similar, whenever somebody decides to make a radical shift away from what they've been doing in order to improve their health and people are like, oh, you know, that's really, that's nuts. Does your doctor approve? You know what? (laughs) It's not going to work. I mean, they, they think that's nuts. And yet they're, you know, they are living a lifestyle like what you were living before. Um, that was literally, that's literally taking you as quickly as possible toward, you know, not only a a short life, a shortened lifespan, but a quite uncomfortable one on the way there. Totally. And and you're making a, um, you're making a very good point that I haven't spoken about for a while, which brings me back to, you know, if, if you and I were sitting in a room and we're having a nice cup of tea and, herbal tea or a smoothie or a juice and we're having a nice chat and a tiger comes into the room we can't in in like it's impossible for you and i to act normal to sit there to keep going and have our conversation with a hungry tiger within (laughs) five feet of us right we are going to be panicking we're going to be trying to put a table between us we're going to it's it's fight or flight we are our heart rates are up, perspiration, adrenal glands have gone full alert for Mm -hmm. our safety because imminent death is near. So how do we know to do that, Laurie? How do we know? You know how we know? It's built into the instinct that we have been passed down from generation of generation of humans before us. So we have this built-in instinct to when something is going to affect our livelihood we act a certain way. Well, we have not had generation after generation after generation to create the instinct to recognize that processed food 
is doing this harm because it's only 75 to 100 years old. Mm. So we haven't had enough generations for that instinct to be a human instinct of reaction. Interesting. The tiger or 100 hamburgers, both will kill you. It's just a matter of time. Right. right? In time. So us humans, we are not really good at managing a threat or a danger to us that takes time to eventuate. You know, whether it's the planet and our environment, whether it's our diet, all of these aspects that are having long-term effects on our overall happiness, life expectancy, health, when they are long-term, we don't, we don't act with any urgency. Mm -hmm. And that's because of our genetic instinct makeup of how our lives have, how, how our ancestors, what they passed on to us. Because mm -hmm. anyone who just thinks that you and I just came out of nowhere, we are a product of thousands of, of uh, grand, grandparents and great-grandparents swapping genetic material to create the incredible one and only you and I. And that, that journey of all of that genetic material that's been swapped. And, you know, there are a lot of people who believe in Adam and Eve and that's 6,000 BC. That's great. That's 8,000 years ago. So there's still a lot of genetic material to be swapped. I personally believe in evolution. So I know it's four or five million years in my mind where mm -hmm. humanoids have been swapping material. This is, this is an incredible time period in either case, whichever you believe, for this relationship with plants to be absolutely at the center nucleus of that continuation and proper propagation of life. Right. So for wow. us, at this period of time, to sit back and to think that we can, in the matter of 100 years, create this food made by people in white coats, that we're not going to end up seeing people in white coats, we all need our head red. If you can't <laughs> see that. Right. Right. It's so true. That's really an interesting way to, to lay that out for people. Um, wow. So before, I mean, I want to be respectful of your time. There's so many things that we could be talking about. I mean, I think that you would, I wanted to ask you about your, um, your three rules you had, I think when we, when we spoke a little bit before you said, I, I have three rules that I live my life by. And, and there were two fundamental principles. Um, sure, do you want to yeah. share those real quick? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I, I, I like having rules. I, I function well with rules. So I, my rule number one is the truth will set you free. I really believe that you got to be careful what you ask for, because if you really ask for it, you're going to, you, you expect and should get the truth. And I think so many of us don't feel free because we can't speak truth. So I think the truth will set you free. Number two is lady luck follows a person of action. You know, I believe in luck, but lady luck follows a person who acts. You've got to do, you've got to make your luck. You've got to get out there and do things to get lucky. Mm -hmm. And then rule number three is uh, you don't learn anything new. You just remember what you've forgotten. Oh, and well, I, I like believe. It. This one relates very much to that all of the answers we have in life, they are all they are all within us. We have all of the answers. We just have to find the right person, find the right time, sit with ourselves, let, let it come to the surface. Mm -hmm. So anyone out there with a really big question that they need answered, you know, should I leave my husband? Should I leave my wife? Should we have another baby? Should we... What job should I do? What, you know, these huge, big things that people are asking themselves that can be weighing on themselves. They know the answer. The answer is within. They need mm. to find a way of bringing it to the surface. Yeah. Perfect. And then, and then my, uh, the other point you asked me about, which is the way that I, um, I, when I look around and I see people who come to me who say they're broken, you know, I, I, the the anecdotal evidence to me is that if you, it's not it's not a hundred percent rule, but I tell you what, it's damn close. That those people out there that are broken, I usually can when I deep dive, I can find that there's either one or two other things in their life that are broken. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And that is, one, their relationship with Mother Nature and plants, and number two, their relationship with self. Yeah. And, and this relationship, these two relationships are absolutely critical to good health and, and going forward and making sure that you can stay, stay whole. The, uh, the, 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 the one about self is particularly important. I always encourage people that we need to be a very much aware of this little voice inside us that's keep putting us down, that tells us we're too, too this, too that, too much. It's all, it's all negative, negative, negative. Mm-hmm. And we need to be very aware of that voice. And we need to become mindful to listen for it. And when we hear it, we've got to belt it down. We've got to, we've got to suppress it. And <clears throat> some people have trouble doing that. So Generally, that conversation starts when they look at themselves in the mirror, mostly in the morning when they get out of bed or have a shower and they look in the mirror and they see themselves. And it's at this moment that the, the subconscious beratement goes on. So I, I, I have a trick where I say, you know, contact your best four or five friends. Well, if you've only got two, that's good. Just send an email, call them up and ask them to give you three or four things that they love about you, that they think is amazing about you, just some qualities that you want to hear back from them. And then write those qualities down, put them on a little post-it note and stick them on the mirror. So the next morning when you get up, you're going to see those comments. You're going to see loyalty. You're going to see uh, honest. You're going to see integrity. You're going to see these things that Mm -hmm. others see in you so that you can focus on those, those positive things because – the benefit of that is starting your day off with that positive conversation means when you go downstairs or walk into your kitchen, you are going to treat yourself with more respect and reverency. You're going to honor yourself and yeah. you've got a better chance of putting a green juice into your body than a bagel with cream cheese. Yes. It, it is so true. I love what you just said. And it is so much about how you value yourself. And if you if you don't have that that sense of self-worth and that the a high sense of value for your for yourself and and enough to respect yourself to treat your body, which is the you know, this it's the vehicle that you have for this journey. And it is it is amazing how many people um don't don't connect that or they're just not it's just not up in their conscious awareness. But um you know you got to shore up your foundation and what you're suggesting is a really great way to, to do that, to start your day by seeing those reminders. Um, and, and also I think to add to that, not only what your, uh, your friends, um, people that, that matter to you, what they say, having those there. And then also asking yourself to, to dig deep and find some of those things that you can agree with that you have in yourself, you know, what do you feel is something good about you and have that conversation and put it up on the mirror. And it's, you know, I've, I've done a similar exercises with, with clients and it's amazing how extremely uncomfortable it is for people to look at themselves in the mirror and say good things to themselves. It's sad. Uh, Absolutely. I, 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 but I understand it. And I can see it because people share intimate things with me about these conversations. I've had enough conversations with people who just tell me how they loathe themselves and so on. And, you know, it is it is sad. But, you know, the, the mindset of the food, it's a combination here because the more, as you call it, dead food you eat, the more mm-hmm. brain dead you are. Mm-hmm. You don't have the energy. You don't feel great. You don't sleep well. You have, you're tired all day. You, you know, it, it all plays. It, 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 it sounds, I mean, it, it is simple because what I'm saying sounds simple and it is simple. It's just the hard part is starting it and then maintaining it. But once you're in it, once you've got the wind at your back, right. it, it becomes second nature. And, and this is what I, you know, I, 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 I use this and I say this because we can, we can end with a happier note that, 
I am seeing changes out there, particularly with the younger generation. People Mm -hmm. are certainly way more aware. I mean, the average 20-year-old is way more aware of this issue than I was when my my group of 20-year-olds, like I'm 54 now. So 30 years ago, the awareness now is tenfold, a hundredfold more. Yeah. You know, yeah. the the number of products out there, the sale of non-dairy milks, that the just you just gotta look at the data, right. the commerce that's around this industry right now. So wellness and this this move to more plants, it is happening and it's happening with gusto. So people are waking up. The power of films like mine and others, power of people like you with your podcast bringing awareness to this. The YouTube does a great job if you want to go out there and find information on this. So yeah. it is, It you know, I'm not a big fan of social media because of the so much destruction that it is doing, but at least in this case it can do positive things. Right. right. So I, I am seeing light here, and I do think that more and more people are less like that woman who said you're crazy. And... <laughs> they're coming around to it. Yeah. We've got a long way to go, but we are making very, very positive uh, inroads. Yeah, there, there is momentum. I, <clears throat> I started, I started on my, um, you know, health freak, I guess, journey. Um, when I was, well, it was the mid eighties. Um, and, uh, it was long before it was, you know, trendy and, uh, you know, you rarely heard the word organic, <laughs> and it wasn't easy to find uh, organic food back then either. Um, but uh, so I, I've been I've been on this road for a long, long time um, for thirty five well, years. Been lonely in the beginning, but now yeah. now it's crowded. Yeah, and now right, I've just I've watched the momentum build and build and build, and it's really exciting. And I I agree, we have a long way to go, and I think that there's um, quite a big battle raging uh, between you know the the makers of of processed foods and um, and the wellness initiatives. I I think that the more momentum uh, we make with uh, healthy eating, the uh, the more advertising and um, tricky marketing uh, they come up with to keep people, uh, you know, buying their products. So I think there's a battle out there happening um, in in the health, the world of health, shall we say, on all levels. Um, I, but, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But we go back to that personal responsibility. And yeah. if we can crack that nut, <clears throat> then nothing can stop us. Right, all- right. It's all about personal responsibility and accountability. And and what I know about my fellow humans on this planet is they respond very well. They respond very well to um, actions of others, okay? They don't respond well to being told what to do. But when they see something, when they see a relative or a friend make huge improvements, get off meds, drop the pounds, look younger, feel better, that inspires them to want to follow. And that's better than any marketing campaign or any television. That's more powerful than any social media post. So yeah. this is a, it's a domino effect. It, it's you know, true. There's enough people doing this. You, it, this is not a, a politics, <clears throat> red versus blue, rich versus poor. This is a very simple... You see someone you love and care about or respect make a change and at work, you are you are more than likely to want to follow in their footsteps. Yeah, totally. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that I like to share, you know, a, the going rogue stories because of that very reason. When people see it happening um, to someone they know or even a lot of times, you know, someone they don't know, just like what you did with your documentary, um, when we demonstrate uh, we, we influence. And so when we can demonstrate really great things and show people what's possible for them, then people, 
they believe and it gives them hope and it does inspire them to take action. So I love everything that you've done. And I think that, you know, we could easily go on for another hour or two. I, I love this conversation, but, but, uh, but you have been very generous with your time. And I, I so greatly appreciate everything that you have shared. Um, before I let you go, where uh, can people find you? Could you want to just quick rattle off your, your website? And um, sure. I will also post it in the show notes too. Sure. So it's rebootwithjoe.com. And I'm at Joe the Juicer on Instagram, Twitter. We have a Fat Sick and Nearly Dead Facebook page, the Joe Cross Facebook page. And if anyone is doing a reboot or wants to do a reboot, there's the Joe Cross community on Facebook. And that's where all the people who are doing reboots live. And that's a very sort of active community. And then my book on on how to how to reboot. Uh, with Joe is the uh, is the book that has everything in it about what I've been talking about and the ways to go about it. You can get that on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or so on. Okay, perfect. Yeah, sweet. And again, I will put those. Uh, I'll put, yeah, my I'm sorry. My website. The movies yeah. are free on my website now. You've got to just sign up to the mailing list, and and the three movies I've made are all free to stream. Excellent, excellent. And I would love it uh, because I would love to talk about your, I think it's your newest movie about um, childhood obesity. So uh, I'd love it if you would come back at some point and talk about that with me. Sounds great, Laurie. Love to. Awesome. Joe, thank you so much. You are doing amazing things in the world. I love it. I appreciate you. Oh, well, thanks for giving me the time. Uh, I'm off to go and get another juice now. And uh, <laughs> as I always say, Laurie, juice on, okay? All right. Thank you, Joe. Wow, that was so awesome. So much good information. And honestly, there was there's even more. And I'm excited to have Joe come back and talk with us again. Um, hopefully, you got a lot out of that. Um, if you have not seen Joe's documentaries, uh, like he said, you can see them on his website. And uh, you can also head on over to Netflix and check them out. If it's been a while since you've watched them, I encourage you to revisit them so that you are re-motivated to dust off the juicer that you may have purchased years ago and has been resting peacefully on a shelf for way too long. Let's get that baby out and fire it up again. Make sure to check out Joe's sites so that you can stay inspired and find support there. Um, there's a lot of really good information there. If you would like some guidance making some other types of healthy shifts in your diet, I invite you to check out my food print plan. You'll find it on my website, lauriebischoff.com. The food print plan helps you create your personal blueprint of a healthier eating lifestyle. It teaches you what to do and why to do it. It contains some of the tools that I use with my private clients and and some cool templates to help you build and streamline a plan. You can also learn what private coaching with me is all about there. If you're enjoying all the good shift being shared on this podcast, it would mean a lot to me if you would take a minute to give it a rating and a review. And it helps others see that it is worth their time to give it a listen. I hope you all enjoyed this week's health shift. Until next week, stay feisty, my friends. Stay healthy and go make some epic shift happen in your life. That goes for you too, Gary V. The preceding podcast was a TJ DeSantis production. Comments, questions, and inquiries can be directed to desantisprod at gmail.com.